Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by former Syracuse basketball player Chris Joseph. I talked with Chris about playing ball with garbage cans as baskets as a kid, becoming a Syracuse fan because of Carmelo Anthony, and his memories of the late Fab Mello. Welcome back to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters. And joining me today on the podcast is a Syracuse fan favorite. And oh, oh yeah, yeah, you are. It's uh, Chris Joseph. Uh, how are you, Chris? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for reaching out. You know, uh, fan favorite, you know, that's that's I, I don't take that lightly. You know, that that means a lot to me for real. That means oh, a lot. I really think you were. I mean, I think fans took to you right away. Um, you know, even though, you know, you didn't come down and you weren't a a starter right in year one, but I think people really liked the way you played and the way you approached the game. And then of course, as your career went on, you, you took on a bigger and bigger role. Yeah. And, um, and you, you seem to have like a little charisma that I think fans appreciated <laughs> too uh, yeah, in, in, yeah. You know, on the court. Right. No, for sure. I remember, you know, doing things like taking popcorn out of, you know, eating popcorn mid game and things like that. So <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. You got you got to understand, like playing for Syracuse was already a dream, but like being able to be there and actually playing and being, uh, you know, part of that seven, eight man rotation, more like seven, you know, at some point, like that was huge for me, you know, so just having fun with it all the time, you know, on off the court, taking my time to like, you know, I, had, I don't know if I want to say I started, but while I was there, I guess my sophomore year, you know, my, just before the games, going in the crowd and signing autographs, things like that. Because I truly, I truly appreciated the fans. Like every time I would go to the mall, which I think, what was it called before? I forget. Um, Destiny or Destiny, Carousel. Yeah, yeah, well, or yeah the Carousel, exactly. The Carousel, like just the love that you get in Syracuse is, can't compete with that. You know, it doesn't get any better. So I appreciate that. Now, you grew up in Montreal. Was playing at Syracuse a dream growing up, or was it – what was the dream when you were a kid? Was it just to go play basketball in the States? Was it to play in the NBA, or was Syracuse yeah. in the picture? So growing up, uh, like, you know, I wanted to become a professional basketball player. I didn't know what the, the – you know, professional. I don't know if I said it at that point thinking solely about the NBA or just – you know, because I didn't know much about Europe. but. When I tell you that's a far-fetched thing, like so far-fetched, especially when I was a kid growing up, Montreal not having a basketball culture at all, really. You know, it was more like you would see more curling rinks and skating rinks around than you would see basketball, of course. It, was, it took a while for us to even get a basketball, like, in our, in our, in our uh, schoolyard. You know, we didn't have anything. We had some dodgeball lines, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, I always wanted to become a pro, and that's because of my brother Maurice, who you know, put me onto the game of basketball and me being, you know, hanging on his coattail since I was a kid and sneaking in the backyards and shooting hoops with him, random places. And, and that's how it started for me. So it wasn't, you know, till a little bit later where I discovered, um, you know, I want to play Division One. Every kid growing up is like, in Montreal at least, you know, you want to go to Duke or North Carolina because those are the games, you know, those are the big dogs. And uh, when I got to a certain age in my teenage years, early into my teenage years, and I discovered Melo, Carmelo Anthony, that, that became my favorite player immediately at that point. So Oak Hill, I followed him from that point on when I, uh, you know, figured out who he yeah. was. Yep. So when I, when he was in Oak Hill, I was, a you know, we had those websites, the scout hoops and the different things where you could see what's going on or whatever they were using back then. And I've been a fan of his since then, you know, and when he went to Syracuse, I said, well, I guess I got to go to Syracuse now. You know, I guess I got to go to Syracuse now. It worked out. I know that's not how it usually happens. You know, I could have went to Syracuse and sat down for four years or transferred, but and it ended up working out. But Syracuse was my dream school because of Mello, first and foremost, then being able to see the games and seeing how the crowd was, the dome, the orange. And I seen Bayheim in a couple movies and I'm like, who doesn't want to play for a guy who's been on <laughs> in movies too? Like it's, it, it seemed crazy, you know, but I, all that mixed together made me believe like I wanted to play at Syracuse. Wow. Now, you, you mentioned how there was kind of like a, a lack of basketball culture in Montreal. And I, I don't know if a lot of folks realize that, that the Canadian basketball is really centered around Toronto. Exactly. Um, Montreal is a little different. I heard one story. I think I remember this. Um, it might have even been you that told it to me that when you were little, you and your brother used to play basketball on like garbage cans. 
in garbage cans. We would dump the trash out, which I don't, you know, I don't suggest anybody to do, you know, but if we would dump it out, we had to do what we had to do. We would dump it out and we would literally play 21 or one-on-one in a garbage can. So it, <laughs> it was insane. Little tin garbage can and uh, we would do that, you know, sorry for the littering and all that stuff, you know what I mean? But we would get there on a Saturday, Sunday after school, whatever it was when all the teachers are gone and dump out the trash and play, you know? That's what it, that's literally what we had to do. It wasn't like, obviously not by choice. We had to do that in order to just go out there and emulate what we just saw Mike and Pip do, or, you know, whoever it is that we were Colby or whoever it was for a while before they put up a basketball hoop in our schoolyard. I guess they got the point, you know, after a while they figured, Hey, look, kids don't want to play basketball. So we might as well put one out there. We have to stop the littering problem. We have to, we have to quit. (laughs) We have to stop these kids from littering, seriously. So they took up, like, they used maybe, like, two dodgeball, I mean, what would you call them, courts or lines, and then they, that's where they made the uh, the basketball court, full court. And so Maurice and Chris Joseph finally have a, a court to play on as kids. Yep, yep, um, Bedford Elementary School, Bedford Elementary School, yep. All right. Now, it, basketball, you didn't. you weren't an immediate success at this. Um, you didn't make every team you tried out for, right, as a kid? No, I didn't. I didn't. I started off. So there's this thing. I don't know how it works in the in the in the states, but like we, if we play city league, there's something called mini, which is the age from like nine to eleven or so, eight to eleven. Then you got bantam, midget, and juvenile, which is the the oldest age group. And so in mini and bantam, so from the ages of like ten to I guess thirteen or so there's this thing called the participation rule where every kid has to play. And in the fourth quarter, you could play whoever you want, you know? So you have to play from mini to bantam. So four years, potentially five years, depending on when you started mini, you have to play. So you could go on a team if you're good enough to make it, which at that age, if you could do a layup, they'll probably put you on a team. Right. So when you get to midget now, participation rule does no longer exist. It's like real coaching comes into play. You're trying to mold these young athletes into you know, learning really, you know, the first few years to learn the game. Now you're trying to win basketball games. Like these, these wins and losses matter. Um, and I played for a pretty good city league, a uh, city league team in Montreal at the time. It was called Sun Youth Organization. Sun and, Youth, um, yeah. Yep, Sun Youth Organization. Yeah. And um, I got to, to midget and I went through the tryouts. I'm just thinking, you know, I've been here for four years now. I'm probably going to make the team just off the strength. And at the end, you know, I'm making it through cut one, day two. I didn't get cut day three. So now it's the final cuts. And there's still about three, four guys to get cut. And the coach calls me over. And he's like, Chris, I got to be honest with you. And I'm like, oh, boy. You know, I, I don't like the way that sounds. You know, <laughs> honesty now during tryouts, like, I don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> and so he goes, um, you're only going to play if we're winning by a lot or losing by a lot. And then I, and, and in my head, I'm like, well, what if every game is close? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're basically telling me I, I won't ever play. So at that point, you know, I guess I wasn't, I would consider that being cut personally, because you're literally telling me I'm not, I'm going to be a practice player is what you're telling me. And I felt like at that time I was better than that. So I ended up leaving that, um, that team. And there's actually transfer rules within the, the city leagues as well. You can't just get cut from Sun Youth and go to another city league team. You got to sit out of here. Why? Not sure. Um, but that's how Canada it is. Canada needs the transfer now. portal. <laughs> yeah. It, I don't know. <laughs> We needed, I needed that. I needed that. So that, that year I didn't play city ball. I only played for my high school. And that's where, um, you know, I got, like I had a little growth spurt within that time. And then what I ended up doing after that year was done, like I got a little bit taller. I was able to hold my skills a little bit more, especially playing somewhere where I was, you know, quote unquote, the man. And I had the ball in my hands. I was able to grow as a player. And the next year, I went back to tryouts, right? I went back. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make this team this year. But then it was the same coach. We got into a little something and, you know, being young. And I already have like a personal vendetta against him for some reason. But he said something to me I didn't like, which I can't remember right now. And I ended up leaving. And I went to like the rival, the rival team. That's like transferring from Syracuse and going to Georgetown, literally. You know what I mean? So I went to the rival team uh, called Dawson Community Blues. And um, I remember we, we beat them a handful of times while I was there. Every time it felt so good. But, yeah, I didn't make every team. Man. I didn't make every team. I was short, chubby. You know, I'd had slow feet. But I always had a good feel for the game. But I guess it wasn't enough at the time until I got my growth spurt and everything came full circle. Now, you ended up going. 
your last two years of high school, you came down to the States. You yeah. went to Archbishop Carroll High School in Washington, D.C. Um, yeah. How did that move come about? Um, is that something that you wanted to do or had to be encouraged to do? No, I was ready to get out of Montreal. I'm telling you, Mike, the, the, the French schooling system was, and still to this day, is hurting a lot of athletes. Uh, the way they're just, or maybe it's not necessarily the French. The French was hurting me, but the Quebec schooling system really um, hurts kids. That's why a lot of kids these days are leaving way earlier to get to the States or to go to prep school in Toronto, things like that. But um, So I ended up going to um, Archbishop Carroll because this guy we all worked out with named Henry Wong knew the athletic director over there named George Leftwich, who played like for Villanova. And he went to Archbishop Carroll with quote, Big John Thompson. Yeah, those and, are actually um, two well-known names within basketball circles, Henry Wong and yeah. George Leftwich. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, we, I ended up going over there. My, my mom didn't really, wasn't sold on the idea. I'm the last of four. I'm her baby. She doesn't really want me to go leave home, stay with a host family. Like people, yeah, you're really shipping your kid off and putting, putting, you know, your child in the care of people who you don't know at all. Yeah, so that'd be a little that's, scary. That's, tough. that's scary. I could I could only imagine now having two of my own. Like, that's tough. You know what I mean? So um, she let me do it. And I thank her to this day for allowing me to go ahead and, 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 you know, try to better, you know, my future in that sense. But I get to D.C. I have to still try out now. So I think we're playing in, uh, I don't know if it was the Kenner League, but, you know, in D.C. there's the Kenner League. But I think it was another... Um, Another summer league that they had going on. There's a bunch of summer leagues going on, and Archbishop Carroll was in a few of them. So I go there, and uh, at this point, I'm like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six maybe, and I have to play. You know, So they just put me out there. I don't know any plays. I don't know anything, but I'm just thinking to myself, I can't go back to Montreal. Like I have to leave here with them saying we want him because it was on scholarship. right? I didn't, I didn't pay for this, out of, or my mom didn't pay for it. So the school, they put me on some type of athletic scholarship. And so – well, that's what it would have been. So I get there. We play the little um, the, the the summer league game. I do extremely well. Um, funny story, like <laughs> I was on the bench, and then you know I got in the game, and there was a timeout, and one of the players who didn't know me, no one knew each other, right? Well, everyone knew each other. They didn't know me, but they just seen that I was six, whatever it was. I was tall. And he was like, "Man, get in the post! Like, why are you always on the wing?" I said, "I'm not no big man. Like, I'm a guard." So then. You know, when he said that, that kind of put, you know, I was playing a little timid. You know what I'm saying? I was uh, letting the game try to come to me, which has been my style for my whole career is just kind of let things come to me. But at that point, when he said that, I'm like, listen, I guess I'm not making an impression if he thinks I'm a big man. So next play down, I remember I do a move down the lane and I dunk it. Bah! And everyone started looking like, oh, my God, this kid's the real deal. Who's this Canadian guy? You know what I mean? So from then, I guess they were sold. The coach was sold. George Leftwich was sold. And, uh, you know, they ended up telling me that I was going to be coming back in August to attend Archbishop Carroll High School. So that was huge. So you, st you spent two years at Archbishop Carroll in D.C. And you, know, you mentioned yeah. earlier that you had taken a liking to Carmelo. You were going to follow in his footsteps. You're going to do whatever Carmelo did. You're going to go to Syracuse. But you're in yep. D.C. Did Georgetown ever make a run at you? Oh, did they? Oh, did they ever? You know, they, they had Big John coming to the games, you know, to come uh, to watch me. And um, I was going to, you know, so, like not not private pickup games, but like I would go play pickup. There would be they would play pickup, not on campus. Sometimes they would go to other places, other locations um, and play pickup. And I would be invited to these runs. And this is what I'm playing against. Jesse Sapp, Dewan Summers is there. Uh, yeah. Like these guys, you know, Pat Ewing Jr. is there. You know what I'm saying? There's a, what's the, the point guard's name? Light skin, John Wallace. Is, what's his name, John Wallace? Well, they had a point guard over there, uh, light skin point guard. But yeah. this, these were this, these are um, uh, Austin Rivers' brother. Jeremy Rivers was playing there still at the time. Sure, so, I remember him. I, yep. So I'm going there and I'm playing pickup and I'm doing well. So I'm thinking, wow, you know, like this is called, and they're, you know, not to say whining and dining me because I'm right in their backyard, but they're making sure that they're keeping in constant contact with me. Um, they're inviting me to these runs, inviting me to games, and I'm seeing the guys. And I'm and at this point, I really like Jeff Green too. Like I like the way Jeff Green played. Um, and you know, they were saying things like I could be the next Jeff Green. You see how he operates in the what's what's that what's that boring offense they play again? <laughs> the, <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the Princeton offense. <laughs> and you know, so I'm like, I like Jeff Green. So that's not a bad comparison. You know what I mean? I could see myself doing some of this thing, like similar things, and you know, but 
I was honestly still, and this is my first, um, well, this is like the first, my first year in DC, right? So on weekends is when we're playing these pickup games and things like that. So I'm still waiting for Syracuse. So, you know, my first scholarship offer actually came from Clemson, but soon after, you know, Georgetown, George Mason, George, while all the Georges from DC, you know, wanted, <laughs> offered me a scholarship, Maryland. So every local school pretty much offered me a scholarship. Then you had Pitt, you had UConn, um, you know, a whole but a, a, a bunch of different schools. And I'm thinking to myself, this is all good and dandy, but where's Syracuse at? Like, I don't understand, like, haven't I reached them? How, like, how does this work? Because I don't know anything about the process, right? Mm-hmm. We in Montreal don't grow up knowing about the recruiting process because it's we don't know, we don't know, especially leaving school or leaving home and going there at 16. Guys go to CJEP. I don't know if you're familiar with that in Montreal. And it's like a prep. That's like prep school. And then they're able. But I was young. I, I knew nothing. But I did have my brother who ended up going to Michigan State and Vermont. So he kind of went through the process. Mm-hmm. Um, but through Montreal, right, I had to leave. But I was able to ask him things a lot. So that was um, that was huge for me having him just kind of guide me and, like, help me out a little bit because, um, you know, had it not been for him, I would have probably committed to Clemson because the way they put the pressure on was like, we offered you a scholarship first. You were just work, uh, sponsored by Nike. But in my head, I'm like, that was like, 50 schools sponsored by Nike. Like, that's not a selling point, but I don't know anything about the process. And I call my brother. I'm like, hey, Mo, they're they're telling me I got to commit because they were the first ones to offer scholarship. He's like, hell no, you don't got to commit. Not right now. Like, wait, enjoy the process, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I did. Um, I I took, but to be honest, I didn't take any visits. I visited all the local schools because I was right there. So it was all like uh, unofficials. And my only one visit was to Syracuse. Oh, so you actually did get up there. Thing. Yeah, was yeah. My, I, I got up there um, for Midnight Madness, the one where AO broke the backboard. Um, and, and, and so who's team? So Dante Green was my host. Okay. AO broke the backboard. So, yeah, you know, so that's what I was waiting for. But funny enough, the reason I get to Syracuse or get on Syracuse's radar is because Coach Red was coaching in the same league I was playing in, the WCAC. I think he was coaching Bishop Ironton, if I'm not mistaken. But I can't, right. don't quote me on that. Yeah. So it was, it was Bishop Ironton? Yes. Yeah. So he was coaching there. And I, it's just funny how things work out, right? Because how does it happen that I get to D.C. when there's an alumni right there coaching? So I end up giving them, uh, I'm pretty sure it was a triple-double or close enough to it. So that Coach Red, you know, I fit the mold at this point. Like now I'm six, like I said, six, five, six, six. I'm long, I'm athletic. So Coach Red calls Coach Murph and says, you know, like I think you, you know, there's a guy out here. There's a kid in, in D.C. from Canada. He just gave us a triple-double. You know, it would be probably good if like Syracuse took a look at him because I was long and athletic, you know. The mold, what you need to be, the criteria <laughs> to yes. be playing at Syracuse, you know, for the zone purposes. And so that's how it happened. And Coach Murph ended up coming uh, at some point and dropping off a letter to our coach, Clinton Perot. And Coach Perot, my high school coach, he knew how badly I wanted to get to Syracuse. And um, one day before practice, he tells me, hey, man, come to my office after practice. I got to tell you something. I'm thinking, what did I do today? I didn't get in no trouble. So, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not sure. Today, anyway. <laughs> not, not today. I, I had a pretty clean day. Did you dump over any trash cans in the, in the, in the school? <laughs> right. <laughs> right there on school property. <laughs> um, so I end up going to his office afterwards, and he pulls out this, you know, he goes in the drawer, makes it all, like, uh, suspenseful. He goes into his drawer, pulls out a few things, then he pulls out this orange letter. And I'm like, nah, that's from Syracuse? What's, what's, what? So I grab it out of his hands, boom. I see it with the nice little blue S on there, how they used to do the uh, the letters. And I open it up, and it was a letter from Coach Murph, just making first contact. Chris, nice to meet you. We're, we're interested. However the letter went. Um, and I was like, they don't even know it, but I already committed. They hadn't even offered me, but I'm committed already. You know, if they offer me, I'm committing. Um, that's amazing stuff. You know, and so you end up coming to Syracuse, and your dream is realized. Yeah. Um your freshman year, coming off the bench, you know, minutes here, some minutes not yep. so there. But yep. I, well, the one thing that always stuck out uh, for me for your freshman year was 
in the six overtime game at the garden. <laughs> and you got to go in and I forget which overtime it was. It might've been the second or third. I think maybe. Like, yeah. It might've been third, even fourth, like maybe third, maybe the third at some point during the third. Yeah. But you don't go in at small forward. <laughs> I don't like, yeah. I don't. And Renze had fouled out. Chris yep. Rick Jackson had fouled out. Yep. Christoph Ogenot had fouled out. Fouled out. So Chris Joseph is going to go in and play center. Going and play like? center. So these guys all get fouled. They're going, they're dropping like flies. I mean, man, we only got but five to, to, to foul out. So AO goes, Rick goes. And now I'm thinking, okay, well, I think maybe Rick, who was the last, I think maybe who was the last one to get fouled out? Maybe it was AO, but whatever it was, when the last, when I knew the last big man, the last true five got fouled out. I told myself, there's no way he puts me in the game at center. Like, he would he would probably rather have Sean Williams, who's seven feet, 6'11", go in there and, like, be some type of a presence, especially seeing as there's a guy down there named Hashim to beat. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he goes, he's looking down the bench. You know, Beheim is probably like, I'm in a hell of a predicament here. Like, who do I sell? Like, what do I do? And he looks at me and he's like, Chris, get in there. And I'm like, whew. I've been sitting on the bench for two hours and 15 minutes. I've been needing to go to the locker room to use the bathroom since halftime. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, this game can't be like, this game got to get finished. Like, I got to go to the bathroom. So now I'm subbing <laughs> in and I'm playing the five. And I tell people this all the time. I literally go into the middle of the zone. And I'm trying to do my best AO impression. Get your hands up and that's it, right? So I go in the game. It's like a dead ball situation, you know, because someone just fouled out. So, we're, you know, I'm subbing in. And I tell people all the time, I look to my left. There's Jeff Adrian, 6'9", 235, maybe 40, built like a, I don't even, action figure. Then I look <laughs> to my right, and all I see is UConn. I said, oh, that, that's the beach. So I only see, I looked and only could see UConn on his jersey. I'm like, oh, this dude, too tall. Seven, what was it, seven two, seven three. Yeah. So I go in there at center, and I know that, like, I'm like, how am I going to get rebounds over these guys? You know what I mean? Like, this is my job. I have to protect the middle of the court, uh, of the paint. So it's insane. In my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, do everything that I can. We still have Paul Harris on the court at this point, you know, who's a great rebounder from the four position. So I knew he would help out. Um, but uh, <laughs> it was tough. And then on the offensive end, I just remember thinking to myself, set all these screens for Andy. Wherever he is, go set a screen for him. I don't know if I got a shot attempt or not. Like, I might have got a rebound or two. I don't even remember. I remember taking a charge or attempting to. Maybe they called it. Yeah. Um, but that's it. That's it, man. But it was huge. It was like, I was like, wow. Like, I'm really, this is a historic game already. And, not, like, I came in and I was a part of it, you know? So, I like when they show it on ESPN. Like, I still get my little cameos, you know what I mean? <laughs> from, that, from that game. Yeah. Um, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, heading into that next season, 2010, which is going to be a magical year. You guys are going to go from unranked in the preseason, the number one in the country, and you're going to be Big East Sixth Man of the Year. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't see that coming because you're going to lose Devendorf and Harris and Flynn yep. off the 09 team. But exactly. all of that season, in practice, you're on the second team going up against the starters, yep. and you guys got a secret weapon named Wes Johnson. Ooh, ooh, ooh. A lot of people didn't know about old Wes, but I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So second you know, team so won a few practice scrimmages, right? Uh, uh, more than more than a few. I'll say that, you know, so it's crazy because Wes and I came in together. Coach Murph recruited Wes from Iowa State and we came in together. We were roommates and it was cool to have him because he was kind of keeping me uh, steady my freshman year. You know, and just, you know, because he'd been through it. You know, he was older. he was a yeah. great player. He was older. So he was able to, like, don't worry, Joe. Everything's going to be all right. Just stick with it. You know, probably Murph telling them to keep me level-headed as well because it was tough. But going in, so going into sophomore year, you know, we were able to see Wes the year prior, like, every day. You know, he was doing it. He had something wrong with his foot, but we could see how athletic he was. We could see he could shoot the ball. And coming into that second year, my, my sophomore year, when he was fully healed, 100% ready to go, we just knew, okay, yes, we lost Paul, but that's a God take that trade off. You know, we lose Paul and gain West. We, you know, that's, that's huge. 
You know, we lose Devo, but now you have an emerging, like, you know, confident scoop, uh, myself, you know what I mean? So it was, it, it ended up working out. And we still have AO. We still have that great inside presence. Man shot 80% down there for his career from the field. <laughs> um, you know, so we were looking good. But so 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 we start off, um, who's the starting five? The starting five that year was well, Brandon uh, Trish Andy. came in as a freshman. Yep. Brandon came in. Brandon comes in as a freshman. So it was Brandon, Andy, Wes, Rick, AO, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And you and Scooper. Me and Scooper. Exactly. We come in at the same time, pretty much. We're just waiting for the first media timeout so that we could come in the game right so um a lot of people didn't see that coming but i think for me personally like i tell people i've told the story before behind being so brutally honest with me and after my freshman year and telling me that i was too fat and that if i don't lose weight i'm not gonna play here ever you know what i mean and i'm like well yeah he has a point because he's like i need you to run son i need you to be able to run the lanes get on transition because that's how we play get steals get on transition try to get easy baskets and, you know, I'm someone I can look myself in the mirror and say, yeah, he's right. You know, as much as it stings at the time and, you, you know, you kind of want to debate it or, you know, come with some type of, you know, response. I couldn't say anything because he was right. At this point, I'm 235 pounds, which I've never been in my life, you know, but I gained that I gained that freshman 20. You know, it was supposed, it's supposed to be 15, but I gained 20 because I wasn't playing. I, you know, channeled that in with a little bit of, you know, mad that I'm not playing so I'm eating and I'm just you know whatever it was happening mm -hmm. and so you know I lose all that weight you know shout out to Ryan Kabilis you know he worked with me uh very very like he worked me very hard that summer mm -hmm. and I was able to get down to like two I remember when when media day when we did media day my sophomore year I remember all the reporters were like looking like who's this new guy like I was slim and trim you feel me yeah. <laughs> and so yep. um, I come in there looking good. And uh, um, that was that was it for me. Uh, I think that was huge. Coach Beham telling me that Coach uh, Ryan Kabilis helped me whip me into shape. I was going to Manly. At this point, we didn't have the Mellow Center. So I was going to Manly Fieldhouse doing cardio like twice a day. Cardio lift and cardio again, eating differently, drinking much more water, a little less juice, a little less juice. You know, I love me some juice, strawberry lemonade, raspberry lemonade, et cetera. But uh, um, so no, nah, so we get into that sophomore year and you know what happens? We lose to Lemoyne. Yeah. Right. So we go into sophomore year. We feel good. We're feeling ourselves, you know, and we lose to Lemoyne. That was the changing point. That was the turning point of our season because um, it's like, how do how we lose to Lemoyne? And they're celebrating over there. And Coach Bayham after the game, boy, that was the longest time I stayed in the locker room. Like everybody was dry, like we like no more sweat. We were in there for a while. And he was just, you know, chewing us out because you know we should never have lost to Lemoyne. But you know, some games you play down to the competition, whatever it may be. You know, you think okay, it's Lemoyne. Traditionally, they they might be scared. We're probably gonna win, whatever the case may be. But we took them lightly, and that's something that we learned that day. Is like you should never do that, right? So that after that loss, like Andy being our our vocal leader, you know, Ao being our leader as well. You know, they didn't let that slide. You know, Beheim didn't either. And from that day, you know, the next day we had, um, I don't want to say we had a day off, but I remember, like I said, we went to Goldstein. It was Wes, myself, Scoop, Rick, AO. We were all, like, the uh, vast majority of us were, were at Goldstein. We went to go get some breakfast, and we said, we looked at ourselves. We're looking on ESPN. They're playing that over and over and over, looking mm -hmm. like they won a national championship. And um, <clears throat> we're looking at the TV disgusted, like, man, turn this stuff off, man. Turn this off, man. Like, we don't even want to see it. But we know that at that point, it burned something in us. Like, it, it definitely hurt us. And we use that as, like, not even to say motivation, but we, we have a, we're way better than losing to the morning, obviously. And I know at that point, Syracuse fans might have been real, real, real scared at that point. If we lost <laughs> to the morning and we got to go play in the Big East in a few months, you know. So, um that was the turning point right there. And we were able, I think we reeled off like 20 in a row before we lost one that year. Maybe 19, maybe, but we went something in O before we got our first loss. I can't remember who we first lost to. Like we were just winning. We I, mean, were I just remember on. it was a magical year. And yeah, um, magical. You know, you had wins at the Garden over North Carolina and Cal. And, yep. And then, you know, by the end of the what? year, you're number one in the country and you're beating Villanova. Um, yeah, that, that the, big crowd, 34 616, if I'm not mistaken. 
Wow, or look at him remembering the attendance was, figures. Of- or was it th- – yeah, no, something something close to that. Now, that was huge, huge year. I remember that game. Like, And for me, um, you know, it was it was motivating. It was it felt good because I was getting some type of – from not playing my sophomore year to coming in um, my freshman year to playing my sophomore year and being the first guy off the bench with Scoop. You know, we were basically coming in at the same time. So being that sixth man and being able to provide that spark that the team needed, knowing that I was – like a, a valuable asset on the team. Like I brought something, I led the team in scoring some nights, you know what I mean? Like, so that was huge for me and always thinking back to where I came from, which is Montreal and what I had to do to, to get here. And I'm, and I'm here now. My dream is I was at Syracuse. That was a dream, but now I'm playing, you know, I'm actually, you know, I have highlights uh, on, on ESPN top 10. And I, like this stuff is stuff that I never thought that I could never imagine happening. I dreamt it and I said it. You know, and I was able to speak it into existence. So that sophomore year was was huge for all of us. Um, unfortunately, you know, yeah. as we know. Disappointing ending. Disappointing ending. We're in the Big East tournament playing Georgetown. And AO goes down. And I want to say the second half with, a, you know, knee or upper, you know, quad injury. And, you know, I remember – that I, I say it all the time. I, I remember not even noticing that I was crying because, you know, between the game and between him falling and I'm not, I'm not thinking of the season. I'm thinking of AO because I know he done had a few surgeries already and he's having a great year. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's having a good year. Like we're winning. That's what you need and able to, you know, try to catapult yourself to the next level. And they use that your wins, how you're playing the Big East tournament, the, the NCAA, uh, NCAA tournament. And I'm hurting for him. You know what I mean? And I remember Hop giving me a towel and telling me to wipe my tear. I'm like, oh, I didn't even – like, I just – I knew I felt sad, but I didn't even notice that I was, you know, crying. So that was – that was a blow, a devastating blow because I think now we go into the tournament still – AO was a huge part of our success, huge, you know, on both ends of the floor. And uh, we go into the tournament, and now I'm I was I, I, I'm starting now. So that's a, a new role for me. Like, it just wasn't the same, and it's not an excuse, but it's just – coming off the bench to becoming a starter like that in that type of, you know, in that moment of the season, it, like it just changed the, 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 it changed the, the, the dynamic of things, you know, it changed the, the, the dynamics a little bit. So, you know, we were able to get Vermont out of there and big bro, you know, that's cool. We got Vermont out of there though. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> yeah. That's by that time, uh, Maurice had gone to Vermont. Right. Um, you know, that year ended in such a disappointing fashion. Obviously, you know, there was yeah. a Sweet 16 loss to Butler, and again, AO couldn't go. Um, oh my your senior year was another one of the most magical years oh in Syracuse history. I think you guys went like 30, 34 and three. Yeah. For Insane. the whole year, only three losses. And it was, like I said, magical year that, similar to your sophomore year, ends in such disappointing fashion. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the whole thing with Fab Mello. Yeah. What was your, the guys, what was, <clears throat> what was your all's reaction when right before the NCAA tournament supposed to start, you get the news about Fab? Uh, yeah. I don't know what was up with that. Like they can, yeah, that was terrible. I mean, it was a, it was a blow to, to all of us because, you know, Fab was our anchor, you know, he was averaging, he got defensive player of the year, if I'm not mistaken. He did, yeah. In the right. Big East, yeah. Yes. And, and, you know, so he was blocking shots. He was setting great screens, catching alley-oops. He was able to run the floor. He made a huge transition as well from when he came in to what he was able to do um, in that year. Oh, you're you know, right. And, as a freshman, he yeah. struggled. But as yeah. a sophomore, yeah, he, he was struggled. a force. Yeah, he was a force. He came in, he did the jump ball and sub right out. That's what he did his freshman year. Like, he didn't play that much at all. <laughs> and so him being able to transition into the player that he became and transform was huge for us. And um, that was a big blow because we knew that we needed, you know, him to to protect that middle because I think at that point, uh, who ended up starting? Maybe by, if I, I, I'm not, I can't remember who it was, but. Yeah, because Rick had graduated changed. the year before. Exactly. So maybe by was starting, which uh, he, I don't know if he was ready to, to really step in and, and, and play that role. Did you guys move Rakeem over to center oh, and move Rakeem, somebody else yep. in it forward? Rakeem, Rakeem started, right, exactly. Rakeem started. Now that was tough for him too. You know, so um, that was a devastating blow. We go ahead and we get to the um, Elite Eight. 
we're playing Ohio State. I, I just know in my heart that if Fab is there, we win that game because, you know, he would have been down there and he would have gave, you know, whatever Fab was giving us, the three blocks, the 10 rebounds, the 12 points, that's huge. We lost that. We lost that. And, um, yeah, that was devastating. That was devastating because I, I remember coming back to school for my senior year. For one, I love Syracuse. Um, but another reason is that I truly believe with what we had coming in and, you know, we would have been able to to do something real special. You know, having guys on the bench, James Sutherland and C.J. Fair, like we had a Neon Waiters. We still, like we were a, a good team. We had a good core of players and our role guys were doing exactly what they were supposed to do on that team. You know, Dion can lead us in points. Trish can lead us in points. One game, school like we were just rocking, we were rolling, and yeah, um, yeah. that was that was that was that was hard. That was real hard. You know, you and Fab kind of remained sort of connected after leaving Syracuse. You're both drafted by the Boston Celtics. Yeah, you both spend a little time in Boston <laughs> and with the main Red Claws. Exactly. Um, so I was wondering, with that extra time, maybe that you had with Fab what it was like for you when a few years later you, you hear about his, you know, his shocking passing yeah. when he died down yeah. in Brazil. Yeah, that was, that was, that was, I was in Italy when I heard the news and I'll tell you a story real quick about that. But, you know, so being, being able to get drafted with Fab was huge because just, you know, you're going into, now you're in the big league. You don't know how it is, but to be able to go there with someone who you, you love as a friend, as a teammate, you know, Fab and I, you know, on South Campus, we lived across the street from each other. We would play FIFA all day, all night, whatever it was. You know, we'd go out, go eat together, all these things. Um, so FIFA. to be able to get FIFA, yep, that was makes sense. FIFA. Yep, makes sense. Makes sense. And um, <laughs> we'd play. So we get drafted to Boston. I remember when he got picked by Boston, I was extremely happy for him. You know, Dion. Fab in the same draft. So I'm happy for my guys. And I end up getting picked up to Boston. Now he calls me and he's like, yo, we're just screaming on the phone. We can't believe it. Right. So it's like, we're going to be together again. We just spent years together in, in Syracuse. And now we're going to go into this new journey together. So that was huge. And we were both kind of dealing with the same things, like having to get, um, you know, go get assigned to the Red Cross together, you know? So, and then when we get called back up, sometimes he would get called up and I would stay or vice versa, but we were together and we were going through it. A lot of the times I spent, I slept at, at, at Fab's house. You know, we were playing, doing the same things, playing FIFA. Um, you know, so once I was out of the league now, my next year, I'm in Europe. Fab is still having, I think Fab is still, you know, going through stuff with Boston and then he gets maybe traded. Um, I remember the next, well, actually the next summer, he ended up with Dallas because the next year I did summer uh, preseason with the, the Magic and we played Dallas. <laughs> And, I, and seeing him again was like, so I went to his, to where he stayed at in Dallas. And that was amazing. Of course, we played FIFA again uh, when I went to go visit him. But that was just amazing to see my guy again. So um, I'm in Italy. And I literally that night, so I'm six hours ahead, you know, in Italy at that time. And I'm having dinner with one of my teammates who, you know, is really, really, really close friends with AO. So we have that connection. We both, you know, AO obviously was my big Make my big brother, and this is his big brother. Uh, his name is Danny. So they're both from DC, whatever the case is. So I'm talking, and he we're talking cues where he went to Hampton for for university, and we're just chopping it up, just talking college hoops. And he ends up asking me what's up with Fab Mello because he was like, "Yo, Fab was a force." We're, you know, we're talking about Fab literally that night. And so, and mind you, like I said, we're six hours ahead. And so I go to sleep and I tell him, I'm like, you know what? Honestly, I haven't heard from Fab in some years. And I, I've been trying to find contact with him because the last time I had spoken to Fab, I think he told me he was having a son. And I had already had my daughter at this point. So I was happy for him. And then I just lost contact. His number wasn't working. Um, and I couldn't reach him. I, I remember reaching out to before his passing, reaching out to um, people who I thought may have a, spoken to him or may have a contact for him, but no one did. So. It was one of those things where it was like, I, I hope he's doing well. So when we're talking about Fab, um, I'm like, man, it's just like he kind of fell off the face of the earth. Like I haven't spoken to him in some time. So I wake up middle of the night, you know, and I'm seeing the reports and I'm seeing group chats and I'm like, what? No, that's not possible. Like I was just talking about Fab literally like four or five hours ago. And this is what you're telling me happened. So that was 
incredibly painful at that, you know, because that's my, that's my guy, you know what I mean? And we were able to, 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 to live our dreams together. Like Fab came from Brazil, went to my went to high school in Miami or in Florida, came to the Q's, didn't speak English, had to learn. Like this guy was, you know, he was, he was a, a hard worker, you know what I mean? So it was tough to, to hear that news and um, it hit me, it hit me hard. Yeah. I, it's, there's been only a couple guys that I've covered that, passed away way too young and fab and conrad mccray are, are are up there and it's like you know it, it's sad to me to, to think of somebody so young passing away and i always think like well what about their teammates you know the guys yeah. that grew up with them and of the yeah. same age it's it's got to be such a a shock as well shock. as a devastating yeah. uh, experience so um, well, let's try to lighten the mood just a little bit here before we wrap this yeah, up. Okay, yeah. Chris. <laughs> yeah, no question. <laughs> um, no question. You're back home in Montreal now. Yeah. Um, what are you up to? So um, I'm, I'm training. I'm getting into the coaching realm of things. Um, so I'm, I'm looking to, to coach. But at the moment, I'm actively training kids. I have a Chris Joseph Hoops that's up and running. So I have kids in Montreal and the outer of Montreal. Uh, reaching out to me to try to get a uh, skills and development trainer. And it's been boys and girls, you know, so it's been fun, you know, cause I, I always enjoyed, I've done camps in the past as well, where I had division one scouts come and, uh, you know, take a look at some of the top prospects in Montreal. So it's always something that I wanted to do when I was done playing and I was able to do it while I was playing in the summertime, create these camps and give these kids an outlet because I knew it wasn't easy for me the way I had to leave home in order to, you know, get this look from uh, Division One universities and et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's something that I always wanted to do, coach, help kids get to the next level and uh, give it back to my community. So that's what I'm up to now, and it's, it feels amazing. Basketball goals, not garbage cans, right? That you're working yeah, on? Yeah, no, the real goal. Now we got courts up. We got some uh, – we got glass backboards and all that. <laughs> yes, sir. Bring it basketball to Montreal. I love it. <laughs> Yep, and you yep. know what? Uh, I know Syracuse fans are going to love listening to you and hearing your stories on, on this podcast, but um, I know some Syracuse fans are already have been hearing you lately. Uh, you've, you've uh, joined up with uh, your former teammate, Eric Devendorf on a, like a semi-regular deal on, yep. on Q sports, uh, Q's talk, right? Yeah. Q sports talk. Yep. Exactly. Q sports it streams. Talk. Yep. It's, it's, it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. At 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., we usually have guests on there. But even if we don't, it's still a great thing to just chop it up. We usually cover, you know, uh, the games, whether it be however many games have passed before we get on. You know, we talk about the games a little bit, uh, give our input on what we think, you know, um, went wrong or what went well. And I think, you know, if anybody is, uh, what's the word, maybe adequate or, you know, uh, eligible to uh, speak on Syracuse basketball, it should be two guys who actually played and who know the zones and know the ins and outs, know Coach Beheim. You know, I spent four years in that program uh, drilling the zone. I, I dream about the zone sometimes, you know what I'm saying? I put my hand up just sometimes in the passing lane, not on my bed, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, so it's, it's fun. It's fun, Eric Diemendorf being a guy who I looked up to as well uh, when I was watching him play um, when I was in high school, just how effortless it was for him to score the ball and things of that nature for us to be able to come together and, you know, have this show where, you know, he asked me if I want to be a part of, and I said, absolutely, you know, uh, it is amazing because I do love basketball. I love talking about it. I love uh, teaching it. So to be able to watch Syracuse games, which I do anyway, you know, and to be able to, and, and to watch it and talk about it a day or two later is amazing. Well, I've heard you guys once or twice. It's really a fun listen. So if anybody's out there and they're looking for it, it's Q Sports Talk. Um, yep. Look for Chris Joseph and Eric Devereaux. Listen, um, Chris, it's been great having you on this podcast and catching up with you. Uh, you look great. You sound great. Um, I, I appreciate your time here today. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you for having me.